Hasn't been commanded, but it's moving in that direction. Pharaoh's first plan, of course, had failed. It was give them slavery and rigorous work, and they still increased in population. Second plan fails also, which is partial birth abortion. Third plan also to curtail the Jews failed. That was infanticide. After they were born, he told his whole people. Did you notice that? It wasn't just the Hebrew midwives. He told all of his people. When you see a Hebrew baby, that's a boy, throw him into the river. Kill him. Infanticide is going on in our country today on the basis of, well, the mother didn't want that particular child. It goes on in China regularly. It's enforced in China. After a first child, the second baby is killed. If the parents dare to get pregnant the third time, not only is the baby killed, but they are heavily fined and perhaps imprisoned. This kind of thing is happening around the world today, folks. It's moving that direction here in the United States. And it's rather interesting to note that this is one of the things that is referred to in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. One of the critical points of the history of Israel that Stephen mentions, and we're preaching on Acts chapter 7 on Sunday evening, so I won't give you that whole sermon here tonight, but it is one of the things that Stephen mentions in his sermon as a critical issue in the history of Israel and how it arrived at its state of apostasy with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Listen to these verses out of Acts 7. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Did you catch the first phrase of that? When the time of the promise drew nigh. You and I have some promises to us. The promise of the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The commands that we are to be living holy lives without reproach so that we will not be ashamed that he's coming. I prayed that a few moments ago. And right now is the time that Satan is putting special pressure on God's people. The question is, will we buckle or will we obey God? Will we compromise? Or will we stand for the truth, not only in what we believe, but in what we do? But when the time of the promise drew nigh. Well, there's incredible other things in this passage. Let me just mention one other to you. It says, in which time Moses was born. The point has been made well by many others, and we'll not preach that here, but the point has been well made that how many incredible scientists would have been born that have been killed through abortion? They might have saved the world from cancer or from heart disease. How many wonderful preachers have been killed through abortion, even by God's people who have practiced birth control in one of the abortifacient manners? How many great musicians have been killed? How many Bachs or Beethovens, Brahms or others? have been murdered through abortion. You know, you stop and think about it. When was Moses born? He was born during that time, and his parents feared God, and they did not fear the king. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us of the faith of Moses' parents, as well as the faith of Moses. These are serious issues, people. We'll preach Acts 7 when we get to it, but I want you to at least be aware that those things are there. It's quoted in the New Testament, which means it is clearly for us to understand. Now, we have to deal with several issues here as we look at this passage in Exodus chapter 1 this morning. The first is the issue of lying. Did God bless the Hebrew midwives for their lying? Because, of course, Scripture condemns lying. It tells us that God dealt well with the Hebrew midwives. It says, therefore God dealt well with the Hebrew midwives and the people multiplied and waxed mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. They have just finished lying to Pharaoh. So does God bless lying? Are there times when we can compromise and get away with it and God will just sort of overlook it? Proverbs 30 verse 6 says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God obviously does not like lying. 
John 8, 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Jesus is unequivocal on that subject. Now that question gets intensified also as we look at Rahab, who lied to hide the spies. And she is listed in the heroes of faith. Shifra and Pua are not listed in the heroes of faith. They're not even mentioned again in the Bible, other than the fact that it says God built them houses. God increased them. He gave them children. Uh, he built them a, a family and a reputation in the name of Israel. But what about Rahab? She's a pagan. And she lies and she hides the spies. And then she gets listed in the heroes of faith. Listen to the narrative. Joshua chapter 2. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy, secretly saying, Go into the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house. She is not a very good woman. She's not a woman of good repute. Named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they came. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I wot not. Pursue them after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way of Jordan unto the fords and as soon as they pursued after them and had gone out they shut the gate. And before they were laid down she, that is Rahab, came up unto them, that is the spies, upon the roof and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you for we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what ye did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token. And that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with these. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And you know the rest of the story. They escaped, and as the, the children of Israel surrounded the city of Jericho, she hung a red, a scarlet line through the window, verse 21. And then when the walls fell, her portion of the wall did not fall, and all that her family was in the house were saved alive and brought out. What a fantastic story of the grace and redemption of God, saving the worst of sinners. The scarlet cord, the picture of the blood of Christ. The way in which the wall did not fall as she and her family were gathered in. And we see an entire family saved as we see in Acts chapter 16. Incredible to follow that story through. But the question is, so why did God put her in the list of the heroes of faith? It tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Two things. Number one, she believed and the rest of Jericho did not. They feared that they did not believe. Rahab believed that Jehovah was God. That he was the living God, the God of heaven and earth, and she trusted in him. And number two, she received the spies in peace. Those were God's messengers. And she protected God's messengers. And so she finds a place in the list of the heroes of faith. We find that is stated for us in James chapter 2 as well. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. We talked about justification by works on Reformation Sunday. That's not salvation by works. That's a declaration of righteousness by works. We are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith and by faith alone. The Apostle Paul makes that clear, one of the major themes of the book of Romans and Galatians. 
But what can other people around us see? They cannot see our hearts. They see what we do. And that's James's whole point. As he talks about justification by works, he speaks of those things which are visible in the sight of men. Show me your faith, O man, without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, the principle that James is discussing is that the genuine salvation that Christ works in our lives will show forth itself by the things that we do. Genuine faith always, let me emphasize that, genuine faith always produces works of righteousness. Not works that save, not works that sanctify, but works that are the fruit of a genuine faith in the true and living God. And so Rahab is honored not because of her lies. And these poor midwives here are honored not because of their lies. They are honored because, number one, they believed the word of God. And number two, they acted on the basis of the word of God. They did what was right in the sight of the living God. We need to notice that they're never commended for their lying. They're commended just for those two things, faith and obedience. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we tell the truth, we're demonstrating faith in Christ. When we lie, we're trusting the devil to get out of our difficult situations. The only other option that we have is to remain silent. Did you know that our founding fathers recognized that those were the only three options, and they built it into the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution? The amendment that says you don't have to criminate yourself, you can remain silent. You see, we had Bible-believing men who founded our country. They weren't just a bunch of, you know, libertarians. They weren't just a bunch of rebels. These were men who had been pushed to the point where they could no longer worship the true and living God. And they said, so we'll do just as did those Hebrew midwives back in the days of Moses. But we also recognize, and we want to protect our people because our government may turn rotten someday in the future. We want to protect our people so that they have the option of remaining silent. They don't have to incriminate themselves. But suppose that they hadn't done that. You know, there are many countries in the world where that's not been the case. For example, suppose that you had been living during Hitler's reign of terror and God had moved you in your heart to harbor some Jews. And so one day the Gestapo knocks at your door. <clears throat> so you've got three options. They ask you directly a question. Are you hiding any Jews here? Your options are number one, you can say no and tell a lie. Or you can say, yes, sure, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are up in the attic. Number three, you can remain silent. You know, now the Gestapo is probably going to search your place. But are you aware of the fact that God is a sovereign God? That God can bind and blind the eyes of the enemy? You know, they may torture you. That's happened to some Christians. They may imprison you. That's happened to some Christians. They may kill you. That's happened to some Christians. But you will have chosen to do what is right. You'll have done what's right on two counts. You'll have done right in sparing the Jews, as did the midwives, and as did what Israel now calls the righteous Gentiles, those who hid Jews during the Nazi occupation, for example, of Holland. Corrie ten Boom, for example, and her family. They hid Jews for a long time. They were finally caught and imprisoned, and Corrie's father and her sister and her brother all died in prison. God spared her life to be a testimony and to remind believers of their responsibilities. They were brave Christians who did what was right, regardless of the consequences. I pray that God will give you courage and steel in your soul if the pressure ever comes upon you to do what is wrong. That you will do what is right, regardless of the consequences. That you will look to man and say, he is nothing, and look to God and say, he is everything. So the things that we need to learn here is principle number one, remember, even belie belie believers do sin and tell lies, but that does not make it right. And God never commends liars for lying. Second principle is to remember God is sovereign. And God can work out the problems without telling lies. In fact, 
in the book of Acts, as we've seen, there are three supernatural escapes from prison. There's Paul escaping by being let down over a basket, by a basket over a wall. There's a supernatural escape from a hurricane shipwreck at sea where nobody could swim and everybody made it to the shore alive. God is not obligated to us to give us any one method of escape. In fact, we need to remember that God is not obligated even to rescue us. In Acts, James was killed with a sword. You have an obligation to God, but he has no obligations except those which he has promised in his word. But he has promised us one escape. And he always promises this escape. He has promised us a way of escape from temptation. You see, these are temptations. And he may make the temptation by letting us out of prison, or he may make the way of escape from that temptation by death. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. When the pressure comes, it is never too strong for your particular point of spiritual growth. You've heard me say that before. You're going to hear me say it many other times. We need to be reminded as Christians because the devil is always lying to us, always trying to seduce us and tell us it's too strong for you. You've got to do it. Or as the comedian said many years ago, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You chose to sin. You disobeyed the word of God when the temptation came. It was not too strong. But you yielded to it. Because God has promised a way to escape. You may not always like the way to escape, but he's promised that the way will be there if you ask him for it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 So that sets the stage for us, then, as to when to disobey the king, those who are in authority. Now most of us look at it as, boy, when do I get a chance to disobey? We start with the wrong motives. When can I disobey? You know, that's the wrong motive. Absolutely. Because the question of when to disobey the king is not a question of choice. It is a question of oughtness or obligation. When must I disobey those in authority over me? And at that point, it's not a choice. It's a matter of obligation to God. You must disobey because God requires it. How different from the American attitude of, man, I sure would like to figure out some loophole here where I can disobey because I don't like this particular thing. That's totally out of the picture when we're talking about disobedience to authority. It's a question of obligation to God. When must we disobey those in authority over us? And God has established all the different tiers of authority that are listed for us in the Word of God. It's a question of oughtness, not when you can choose to disobey. Disobedience is never an option. Disobedience is only permitted when it is an obligation. God has established the entire structure of authority on the earth. It's our obligation to obey those in positions of authority over us in everything unless God requires us to disobey. The home, the church, the government, employment, and so forth. You see, those in the spheres of authority, when God sets those out, authority... And obedience is assumed in Scripture. Disobedience is only permitted when required by God. When is disobedience required by God? I can think of only six general instances when disobedience is required by God. And sometimes these overlap. Here they are. There are six of them. When God requires you to disobey those in authority over you. Number one, when the person in authority requires you to disobey the Bible. That is, the commands of Christ. Number two, when the one in authority prohibits you from obeying the Bible, that is, the commands of Christ. Number three, when a lower authority requires you to disobey a higher authority. If a sergeant tells you you must disobey the general, for example. Number four, when a lower authority prohibits you from obeying a higher authority. The general has told you to do something, the sergeant interrupts that course of uh, obedience and forces you to disobey the general. Number five, when one in authority requires you to lie or to keep silent about the truth. Number six, when an authority requires you to pit one biblical requirement against another biblical requirement. Every one of those six principles is illustrated for us 
in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> we find the apostles are boldly preaching the gospel of Christ. They're preaching the resurrection from the dead. We find thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit is moving in a powerful way, and it becomes a little upsetting for the Sanhedrin, for those who are in charge of the Jewish people under Roman law. As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in the hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Now they've just, they've just healed this uh, crippled man there in the temple. He was 40 years old. Uh, and many people came to Christ as a result of that particular miracle. And so the next day they're being examined and <clears throat> the senator asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, unto all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, and which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They looked at them and they said, boy, these, these guys have been with Jesus. <laughs> they take note of that. These are ignorant, unlearned men. They've been with Jesus. When people listen to you, do they say, whoa, he or she has been with Jesus. So they send them out of the council. They say, what are we going to do? There's a notable miracle. We can't deny it. The guy is healed. He's here. He's 40 years old. You know, all Jerusalem knows about it. So what they do, that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. There's a prohibition. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. The apostles understood the issue of when must we disobey. Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. You know, they go out and they preach again. They get arrested again. They're told, Hey, why did you do this? They're thrown into prison. The angel of the Lord comes, lets them out at night, tells them to go back to the temple and start preaching again. So they go back, they're preaching. The next morning, in, in come the, the guards looking for them to bring them for their trial before the Sanhedrin. And the prison is empty. They go back and say, hey, we don't know what's happening, but the prison's empty. We left them locked in chains and we had guards in front of the doors and the guards were still standing there, but the, the prison was empty. And then another guy comes running and says, you know those guys whom you arrested? They are preaching in the temple again. And so, when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they told them. And the high priest and the captain of the temple, uh, and the captain of the temple, the chief priest, heard these things. They just doubted as to where and this would grow. And so, after they're told, the captain and the officers go again and bring them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them. Now, now here they have an opportunity to do something about it, because they had already told them not to do this. So this is a direct disobedience to a command that was given by someone in authority, the highest authority in the Jewish religion. Saying, did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, it was already upon them. They themselves had asked for that curse. His blood be upon us and upon our children just before the crucifixion. That's one of the things that enabled Pilate to wash his hands and say, okay, it's not on me, it's on you guys. You've already taken it on yourselves. No, they had already brought his blood upon themselves. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on the tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. You see, what was the last thing Jesus had told them before he went into heaven? In the book of Acts, chapter, eight, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, You are my witnesses. I'm giving it to you. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. You're it. 
Now go out and do it. They received the Holy Spirit a week later on the day of Pentecost, and they obeyed. You and I have the obligation when we have the command of God to obey. And if we have the command of God and someone tells us to disobey, our response is we must obey God rather than man. God has established the authority structure, but if the authority structure tries to block what God has commanded us to do, then we must. It's an obligation. It's not an option. It's an obligation. We must disobey. So here are the times again that you are required to disobey a lower authority. God and the Bible are always the highest authority. God has revealed himself in the Bible. You will not get special divine revelation. When you obey the word of God, you are obeying God. When the one in authority requires you to disobey the Bible, the commands of Christ, prohibits you from obeying it, requires you to disobey a higher authority, a lower authority prohibits you from obeying the higher authority, requires you to lie or to keep silent about the truth, which we clearly see in this passage, or when an authority requires you to pit one biblical requirement against another biblical requirement. We see those principles illustrated here in Acts 6. The Sanhedrin required them to disobey the command of Christ, which he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Sanhedrin said, No, you can't do that. Maybe you can do it someplace else, but you can't do it here. They were required to do it. They were told they couldn't. The Sanhedrin prohibited them from obeying the command of Christ. In this case, it's the same as requiring them to disobey a command, prohibiting them from fulfilling it. The Sanhedrin was the lower authority, making the requirement and the prohibition. The Sanhedrin required them to keep silent about the truth. The Sanhedrin required them to pit one biblical requirement against another. That is, Christ told you to go and preach the gospel. He also has commanded you to obey those in authority. That's pitting one biblical requirement against another. Satan will often do that to try to confuse you. You always obey the highest authority. Not every situation will involve all six of these issues. It did here in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. But that's to show us the interplay. Always be alert for it. Now back to Exodus chapter 1 verses 15 and following. The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra and the other Puah. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, when they're there on the birthing stools, kill the boy babies. Now, you can't cut that any other way. You can't say, well, we misunderstood what he had to say to us. They had an option of killing the boy babies or of not killing the boy babies. Those were their only two options. They chose to obey God and not kill the boy babies. They understood the Abrahamic covenant. They understood the promises that God had made. The time of promise was drawing nigh, and that's why Satan is putting a greater deal of pressure upon the people of God, and it's happening here in the United States today. But the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. They had knowledge, and they had the fear of the Lord, and they did not fear the king. Just as Moses' parents did not fear the king, but feared the living God. You and I have a choice of our fears. One fear is commended in the Bible, and one fear is condemned in the Bible. The fear of man is always condemned. Because it will always bring you to compromise, it will always bring you to sin. The fear of the Lord is commanded in the Bible. It is a knowledge of the Holy One that gives you understanding. The fear of the Lord, if you track that through the book of Proverbs, you find that it is always related to saving faith. A genuine faith that says, I will trust the living God, even as Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And that is the faith that God blesses. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Here they sin. Oh, you and I will not be blessed for our sin. There is never commendation in Scripture for lying. But then we find God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And it came to pass, here's the reason for the blessing, because the midwives feared God 
that he made them houses. It tells you in the text why the blessing came upon them. What would have happened if this, what we might consider very insignificant group of women, failed to do what God required? We think there's a very small portion of society. And among the millions of the Hebrews, that was a very small portion of society. They're just the ones who deliver babies. But what would have happened if that insignificant group of women had failed to do what God required? Would Moses ever have been born alive? Would the children of Israel ever have been delivered? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, because of the promise of God to Abraham. But those who were involved would never have received the blessing of God. And that's what we have to understand. God is sovereign. He will accomplish His purposes even when we sin, even when we disobey. But we will not receive the blessing because these midwives feared God and they acted upon that basis. God blessed them with houses. God multiplied them. God gave them families. God raised them up. Folks, the day may come when you and I will be put to the test. Will we fear God or will we fear man? Will we obey the command of God or will we understand that there are times, not merely when we may disobey authority, but when we are required by God to disobey those in lower positions of authority less than God in the Bible? When the test comes, are you ready? Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be ready. Help us to be a people, called out people, called by your name people, separated people, those who have kept from the compromise of the world and the intermarriage and all the intermingling that goes on in the world. A people whom you make mighty because we trust in you, the living God. A people who walk by faith and not by fear. A people who keep our eyes on eternity and not on temporal things. Help us always to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised the cross, the shame, and he bore the cross for us. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, Father, help us to consider him who endured such contradiction against, of sinners against himself, lest we become wearied and faint in our minds. Make us men and women, boys and girls, who stand for the truth and who do what is right, because we trust in you, the living God. You've given us the strength for it. You've given us the empowerment by your spirit for it. You've always made a way of escape from the temptations that come our way. Make us men and women who look for the way of escape rather than looking for loopholes, how we can choose to disobey to satisfy ourselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.